All right. Well, welcome everybody to our uh, fifth UDL IRN Network and Learn. We're excited to have you here today and excited to have our panelists join us this evening as well. Um, so we have with us uh, Dr. George Van Horn and Carrie Wozniak, and I'll do a more formal introduction of them in just a moment. Also joining us uh, tonight is Brian Dean from the UDL IRN. Uh, he will be our Twitter uh, master this evening uh, and keeping us hooked to the audience so that um, we are interactive and networking. So for those of you who are online and um, uh, watching via the webinar, welcome. We're so glad to have you. We see we've got folks here from uh, Australia and Puerto Rico and uh, I'm sure some from the U.S. as well, although they haven't chimed in yet, so maybe we'll hear from you. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. I do want to bring up our PowerPoint presentation for um, tonight. So I'm sorry, I'm working backwards here. Um, this is our welcome. This, this tonight series is called uh, UDL, Growing District Capacity. And um, most of you have seen our logo, we will be using this kind of logo to um, advertise all of our network and learn. So you'll become familiar with that. When you see that, you'll know it's from the IRN and it's a network and learn series evening. So tonight to get your feedback and to hear your questions, we will be using Twitter to uh, gather those and our hashtag for this evening is as always, hashtag UDL IRN. Um, it's your questions and your comments that really make this Network and Learn come to life. So I encourage you to be thinking about things that um, are in, of interest to you or burning questions as our presenters are talking so that they can, um, you can gather some thoughts and ask good questions and we can keep the learning happening and keep it dynamic. Uh, my name is Susan Harden and I am on the board of directors for the UDL IRN. I'm the Assistive Technology Consultant at Macomb Intermediate School District um, and uh, uh, work on the Professional Development Committee for the IRN and I'm delighted to be the moderator this evening. And Brian, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Brian Dean and uh, I'm on the UDL IRN board and uh, I'll be trying to work some keyboard magic uh, through the use of Twitter um, and that's, that's all I got. Let's, let's get to it. Let's get going. All right. Uh, as I mentioned, our panelists tonight are, are Dr. George Van Horn and Carrie Wozniak. Um, George is going to start tonight, so I will start with George's bio. Uh, George is currently the Director of Special Education for the Bartholomew Special Services Cooperative in Columbus, Indiana, and he's a member of the CAS UDL faculty cadre. Uh, Dr. Van Horn has completed both his Bachelor of Science and Master's of Science degrees at the University of Dayton. He received his Doctoral of Education degree from Indiana University with a concentration in the area of <laughs> administration and special education. He's been a teacher of students with emotional disabilities for Montgomery County Public Schools, and not the one in Maryland, but the one in Dayton. Uh, in addition, he served as principal, school superintendent, and director of special education in several public school districts in the Midwest. Dr. Van Horn has also been an adjunct faculty member at Indiana University Purdue, uh, wait, at Indiana University Purdue University, Columbus, Manhattan College in New York, and Northern Illinois University. And he consults with school districts throughout the country in the areas of positive behavior intervention supports and universal design for learning and inclusion. So we are delighted to have George Man, that is a one heck of a resume, George. Love it. Okay, also with us tonight is Carrie Wozniak. Carrie is the Assistant Superintendent of Fraser Public Schools. Her work in Fraser focuses on K 12 curriculum and instruction. Fraser at Public Schools has deployed over 5,000 iPads district wide, and she's worked closely with her technology department to ensure that students, teachers, and staff have the training and background to implement a dramatic change to the learning environment. She works closely with staff to develop and design professional development 
and they have used the principles of universal design for learning as the foundation of their instructional change. Before taking the position as assistant superintendent in Fraser Schools, Carrie was a literacy and English language arts consultant for Macomb Intermediate School District from 2006 to 2007. So again, welcome Carrie and George, we're delighted to have you. Good to be here. So, oh, good, Carrie, want any opening remarks? No, I'm just really excited to be able to share our story and you know, it's great to obviously be able to network. Um, Obviously with George, I know he's doing great things in Bartholomew and we've been able to kind of connect and hear about some of their journey. And I think the more we can partner with other people and other districts, the better off we'll be. Absolutely. All right, so tonight's plan for the webinar, part one, um, both Carrie and George will tell their district's uh, UDL implementation story. In the background, Brian will be checking the Twitter feed to check for questions, and um, we'll have an opportunity to ask any clarifying questions we have after our first <laughs> Then in part two, um, George and Carrie will talk about some implementation pitfalls to avoid, and then some celebrations from their impl implementation, and then we'll come back to the Twitter crowd for uh, additional questions, and then back to the presenters for final thoughts. So, without further ado, I'm going to bring up George's info infographic that describes their journey at Bartholomew Schools, and I'll give it over to you, George, to go ahead and tell your story. Okay. Well, first of all, if they're listening to my bio, it kind of feels like I didn't know, don't know really what I want to do um, <laughs> because I've been in so many different uh, positions. But uh, actually, the, the job I have now is the one I've had the longest. Um, I've been in Bartholomew um, Consolidated School Corporation for 16 years. And I think what's uh, kept me interested and excited about being there is the work that we've been doing on uh, with UDL and the fact that we have a focus. Um, so um, a little bit of a, a journey um, going back to when I started in 2001, as you can see by the graphic in 2002, 2003, we started to look at how we were making instructional decisions. And it really was focused on special education because um, as I looked at around the district, um, uh, we thought we were a pretty inclusive district, but as I visited schools, it, it became kind of apparent that we, um, probably what we thought really wasn't in reality what we were doing in some cases. So uh, the way we addressed that was to begin to think about how we make instructional decisions for all students, but in particular students with disabilities. So we brought together building teams and uh, worked with uh, Dr. Sandy Cole from Indiana University and really just started asking questions. How do you decide uh, which classroom students are in? How do you decide which materials are being used? How do you decide which teachers? Just kind of some basic sorts of things to get folks thinking about um, how we made decisions around students with disabilities. And the really cool thing was, as we, as we started talking about that, what people started to realize was that the, the decisions that needed to be made for students with disabilities were the same ones as for all the other students. So it really started our or started to move us to a conversation about all students instead of regular ed students and special ed students and ELL students and high ability students. We really started talking about all students. So that was kind of a nice, a nice step. Um, after that, we had the opportunity to, um, to begin to work with patents, um, which is a statewide project in Indiana and it's currently uh, directed by Daniel McNulty, but way back, um, I think Daniel was still a, a young child back in 2003. It was led by Vicki Hirschman. And one of the things they did was identify pilot schools each year. And we were fortunate enough to have one of our elementary schools identified. And again, it was really a bit more special ed focused. Um, but what uh, the, the patents team did is came in and worked with the entire building faculty and actually they utilized the book, uh, Teaching Every Learner in the Digital Age uh, from CAST and really did a book study and conversation. So at one elementary, we really started having some good um, conversations about universal design for learning. And then as time went on, we actually were able to get several other um, schools identified as pilot sites. And that, that sounds easier than it was. There are only six pilot sites identified in the state each year. So getting selected was really uh, a really achievement for the, the faculty of those buildings. And so we kind of continued to, to move in that direction. Um, 
around 2003-ish, we also uh, were fortunate enough to receive a federal grant um, to implement positive behavior uh, supports across all the buildings in our district. And again, working with Dr. Cole from, from Indiana University, she helped us write a plan and uh, we had an interesting conversation. And this is probably when I realized um, I was in the right spot because the, the question was, well, which schools do we want to pilot for PBIS? And we have uh, 11 elementary schools, two middle schools, and uh, uh, two comprehensive high schools, and then a new tech high school. So we have you know, quite a few buildings. And I said, well, we have to do them all. We can't just pick one or two because when the grant's are over, how am I going to kind of move on to the next building? So we started looking at the whole district, and that kind of became the theme of everything we've done in BCSE over time is we really look at the whole district and really started having conversations. The PBIS piece really connected nicely or kind of was a nice step in UDL because we changed the I in PBIS and as many people know, it's positive behavior interventions and supports and we felt that was a really reactive kind of word intervention, like somebody had to do something, so you had to intervene. So in our district, PBIS is positive behavior instructional supports, because we really think the key is about teaching behavior, not about reacting to it. Um, and if you think about UDL and the principles and the guidelines, that's a perfect, perfect fit and a perfect support. So we, we kind of continued that, that conversation. And as we move forward and had more buildings uh, become pilots in UDL, it really became apparent that this needed to be the framework for everything we do in BCSE. And at the time, uh, Karen Garrity was our director of elementary ed. And coincidentally, she was the principal of the first pilot school that we had. So she had some background in UDL. And Bill Jensen was our director of secondary ed. And when one of our middle schools became involved as a pilot, he was reading those books. And we all kind of started talking. And, and I think it was Bill who said, this is the framework we've been looking for. This ties our work together. This gives us a focus, and it allows us to sort of have a, uh, a, a filter to, to run everything through so that we're all going in the same direction. Um, and as we, as we began to broaden that, we again brought in building teams. Uh, each of our buildings has a continue, continuous improvement committee, and we brought subgroups of, of each of those buildings and began providing them some training in UDL. And, um, asking them to begin to incorporate UDL into their school improvement plans. Um, and as you can tell, I'm not necessarily following this timeline as it goes because that's way too linear for my thinking. Um, but uh, so we began to have those teams and then they went back. And then as time went on, we really felt like, well, we needed somebody to come in and support us. And we brought in as uh, the great Louis Lord Nelson. Uh, many of you know her and her, her fabulous book, Design and Deliver. Um, and she actually came in as a part-time independent contracted person. Um, and little did Louis know that that part-time uh, really meant we were gonna pay her part-time, but she was gonna put in a whole lot more hours than she ever expected. So basically we had Louis working as our feet on the ground in the buildings. Um, and then after, uh, she can probably correct me, I want to say four years, uh, Louis uh, had the opportunity to go on the cast and work on, as a postdoctoral fellow. And at that point, we really decided, well, we need a full-time person and we, re and we really need an employee to do this. And, uh, and our, our uh, you know, superintendent was involved in kind of these decisions and Rhonda Laswell was hired as our, our UDL coordinator. So she was our first employed UDL coordinator. And then we began to, to partner. Um, we were utilizing instructional consultation teams as our problem solving process. A lot of districts use teacher assistance teams or student assistance teams. Um, uh, Todd Gravois um, kind of championed this uh, process called instructional consultation teams. And it's a bit more focused on working one on one or as we say shoulder to shoulder with the teacher as they identify issues. So that became another natural fit. And that uh, uh, person, Tina Green, who was coordinating that, um, that became our second UDL coordinator position. And then a year or so ago, as we were looking at um, repurposing a district-wide, um, another district-wide position, Angie Winicky became our third UDL coordinator. So as time went on, we began to add more supports and it became clear we needed those supports in the buildings. And um, over time and, and implementation of UDL, what we were finding were we had less referrals 
to special education, and we were seeing a decrease in the number of students um, requiring special education. Well, in most districts, when um, your student numbers go down, uh, the standard practice is you also cut staff. Um, luckily, we had um, a pretty visionary um, leadership team and superintendent, and Dr. Quick, who agreed that that didn't make a whole lot of sense, that we needed to cut some staff, but we needed to repurpose other staff so that we didn't end up on a hamster wheel and pull all the supports out and then students begin, to begin not to be successful. Um, and the reason students were successful was because things that used to be required in an IEP for people to provide were now becoming just an option in our classrooms and in our learning environments. So our focus on creating um, good quality learning environments with options for students really began to sort of reap the rewards of students being successful in general ed, which allowed us to free current resources and use them differently to continue providing supports to teachers. So that, that's kind of a, um, a very quick uh, evolution in time. And um, we've had some great success. Our student outcomes are, have been very positive. I think our teachers really enjoy the learning environments they created. Um, so really for us, UDL is our district uh, framework for curriculum and instruction for all students. And um, that's one thing I might suggest to others is the first question you might want to ask is what is your district framework for curriculum and instruction? And I think in many districts, there's not an answer to that. Um, and, and by having a district-wide framework, it helps you begin to bring the work together. Uh, if, if you think of, um, I don't know if any of you are fans of crew or rowing, you know, where they put all those people in the boat and they all row together. Well, a lot of times districts have all those people working very hard, but they're rowing however they want, so they're really not going anywhere. And once you get everything in unison, then you really start to move forward. And, and that's what UDL has really done for us. And that's probably enough from me, I think. Uh, Carrie can kind of pick up and maybe tell her story. Thanks, George. That was awesome. I uh, appreciate that, the um, look back and the look forward. Um, it's just fascinating how um, teams grow and uh, develop to fit the needs of the district. And I also was so impressed with your comment about BCSC. Uh, their UDL implementation coincided or supported or at, resulted in reduced referrals and reduced special education. That's some really powerful uh, statements and, and ones that I, I think all of us are excited to hear about. So thank you. Can I just, clear, can I just throw a little piece onto that one? Absolutely. While it did decrease the number of students with disabilities, it, our enrollment in, remained the same. So it wasn't like we were losing students. And student learning or student outcomes at least measured by passing our state test, which we're not, we're not real big on, um, increased, the percent of students who passed the test increased in every subcategory from 2009 annually through 2014. So we saw some great results. Yeah, that, that's exciting stuff, excellent. All right, Carrie, I'm gonna uh, give it to you. I'm gonna mute my mic and then I will bring up your graphic full screen and let you have a chance to tell your story. Thank you. Um, a lot of similarities uh, to what, you know, George talked about, and I, I think that's really, um, you know, important that um, we hear that, that those, you know, similarities are there, and there's some key things that I think, you know, um, all staff can move forward with. This little graphic that we put together here really defined what our, our strategic plan was all about, and approximately, oh, four years ago, five years ago, we really decided um, that we wanted to transform the learning environment, that we wanted to personalize the learning for all students. And we spent a lot of time talking about, you know, that sage on the stage where the, the teacher was delivering information, you know, in front of the classroom, moving students uh, by age, you know, the whole cohort model. And our conversation started with, you know, how can we personalize the learning for all children? How can we um, make sure each child is um, treated differently, you know, individualized. Each child has these um, individual opportunities, but still have that community that's so important with school. And we passed a bond in um, 2011, and we were able to um, go one-to-one, -one, but we didn't spend that money right away. We waited a year before we purchased any technology, and we spent a lot of time talking about what we wanted the learning environment to look like. And I, I really think that the um, principles of universal design for learning help ground our work. 
We spent a lot of time um, talking about not only um, what kind of uh, digital environment we wanted, but what did we want the learning environment to really look like? And that caused us to have a lot of conversation around um, the role of the teacher and how the teacher really needs to um, be a facilitator of learning. And they had to really be purposeful in the way they started to design their curriculum. And again, I, I think the principles of universal design for learning became that um, layer that we could all um, kind of hang our hat on. Uh, it gave us a framework, as George talked about, that um, really drove our curriculum. We finally had a, a kind of a template that we were able to use to design our instructional practices. And that helped us tremendously with moving on to this idea of a, a competency-based learning model because you really can't have um, students moving at their own pace and you know building these individual plans or you know having multiple means of assessing them if you don't have a, a clear path for your curriculum and a, a clear path of what the great or you know this what happens before and what's going to happen in the future and um, the training that we received from our ISD, and I'm going to give a shout out to Sue around um, the E3T project, was crucial to our professional development. We used a lot of the um, work that they did with um, Universal Design for Learning on multiple means of representation, multiple means of engagement, um, multiple um, means of having students show what they know with assessments to start guiding our work. And that was critical. I, I think when you're in this journey of kind of trans, of transforming the learning environment, having um, professional development that you can implement with fidelity was very important to us. We wanted to make sure that all of our buildings um, had those same experiences. So when I heard George talk about, um, you know, having a grant and then saying, okay, what schools are we going to pick? We never wanted to do that. It was really important to us that every building um, had that same opportunity for equity. So for us, we wanted to be really intentional about our um, you know, professional development and how we framed that out. So it was um, all six of our elementaries, our middle school and our high school, um, you know, made that commitment to use the, the framework around um, universal design for learning. And it's still evolving. I mean, if you look at this graphic that I'm showing you here, we're at the point of the teacher starting to become the facilitator and kids are starting, you know, to work at their own pace. And now you're giving kids choice and, um, you know, making decisions about the when and the where of um, learning. And that's creating all sorts of, you know, um, new opportunities and challenges, I guess is the best way to put it, because there's a lot of um, management that comes along with that. And um, that's exciting, but it's also um, kind of stressful for teachers because they have to start to give up that control that they've always had in the classroom. So we're having right now in Fraser, you know, a lot of conversations around what does this new learning environment look like? You know, what does um, move on when ready look like? You know, how do you, you know, manage all of these, um, these different pieces while still trying to, um, you know, uh, personalize the learning for our students. So we're right now at the point in our journey where we're kind of focused on competency-based learning and we're really looking at that idea of anytime, any place um, learning for our students. So it's been exciting, but it's also, you know, has its uh, opportunities to be a little bit scary for some of our teachers. So that's kind of where we're at right now. All right, Carrie, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I, I, was, uh, I was struck by how uh, similar your conversation was to George's, and I think that's really powerful. You know, it's interesting to see you both came at it from different places, but ended up on that same journey uh, and really taking advantage of your staff and bringing them together to work collaboratively on designing this practice. I think that's so powerful. And I, I wanted to say one more thing about what George talked about, the PBIS piece. Uh, that was, a, you know, another important part of our work that we've um, built into the system. And I, 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 you kind of gave me a, a bit of an aha because that work, I've never really directly connected back into universal design for learning. And I think that's an important point that you made about the importance of the PBIS. And that really helps build in that whole idea of a growth mindset and students owning their learning. And we've had a lot of conversations about how we can be very purposeful and intentional with that part of the, um, the conversation. 
Excellent. Thanks for adding that, Carrie. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen momentarily, and I'm going to give it over to Brian to find out what's happening in the world of Twitter. So go ahead, Brian. I'm going to mute, and you go ahead and let us know what's on everybody's mind. Uh, well, it's burning up out there on Twitter. Um, so I have two big questions um, uh, that, uh, that, that are out there. So Lindsay Slater, uh, what up, Cleveland? Um, Lindsay Slater, who is at Lindsay Joe Slater, um, ask the questions, uh, what were the specific supports that were provided to your educators within your buildings while you're going through this kind of process? Um, I can go first if that's okay. Yeah, heard, please do. George mentioned um, some of the, the additional staff that they put into place. We put into place um, coaches and we call them 21st century literacy teachers and they were put into place at every building and they, they teach part of the time, but they have very um, specific designated coaching time and that has been really really helpful because we're able to systematically you know implement um you know certain strategies or um you know tackle certain challenges that we might have for example right now um we have a, a learning management system and we're trying you know to make sure that that's implemented with fidelity and the design pieces um done with fidelity and teachers know how to you know access reports use that data efficiently and with the 21st century teachers they're able to work together to develop professional development and then go back to their buildings and implement it and having i think a cadre of teachers that um, believe in the work and really believe in the vision have been instrumental to us i think um moving forward because they are not only in the classroom but they also have that release time to work with their um their peers so those 21st century literacy teachers have been um a crucial component of the work that we've been doing in frazier uh george you're muted bro I, I just don't want to miss a bit of the wisdom that you're about to drop so i want to let you know that Actually, anyone from BCSE who's on there is very happy that I was muted. So, <laughs> um, and by the way, I have to give a little shout out to Leanne. Can you see this? This is a great tie that she gave me from Australia that I'll be wearing tomorrow morning at the Ocali conference for my presentation. All right. All right. So Australia travels. Anyway, side note. Um, <clears throat> when we started, we basically had no supports for teachers. Um, as I said, we had Louis trying to cover 17 buildings, you know, uh, 750 uh, teachers or so, which kind of kept her a little busy. Um, but I think what we had were um, teachers who were really interested and hungry to learn how to do things better. And, and that's a, that, and, and I know later we'll talk about positives, but that is probably the biggest, one of the biggest positives we've seen was our staff really begin to flourish. Um, so what we did was start to target our professional development around UDL and any kind of trainings that were brought in, whether it was, you know, on the latest and greatest program, the question was asked, how does this support the implementation of the principles and guidelines of UDL? So we started the conversation about connecting. Um, one of the, I think it may have been our second year, maybe the first year Louie was there, we held our first UDL forum, which was a one day training for our teachers. Um, and we were fortunate enough to have some really, um, really cool um, speakers come and join us. Um, Tracy Hall from CAST uh, was there, and you know, another year David Rose came. And you know, how do you go? How do you go anywhere from there? Uh, Ricky Sabia came in and talked uh, another year, and then we also brought in our own teachers who talked about what they were doing in classrooms. And what we really found were teachers wanted to hear from teachers. And they want to know how are you doing it in your room or what do you do when this happens and really providing uh, the networking piece and allowing teachers to talk to teachers kind of like we're we're trying to do right here and connect you know from district to district person to person having those networks um so you have folks to talk to so i think anything you do to create a conversation for teachers is really good and if you're an administrator um and you want to talk call me i'm always looking for a critical friend to help us get better i mean many moons ago denise DeCosta and i used to call each other once a month just to talk about what worked and what didn't you know as time went on and we repurposed positions now we have a half-time udl facilitator in every building and the focus of that role is really to provide support and training to teachers help teachers look at their learning environment 
Um, it's not uh, a role that's designed to for the teacher to go, hey, George is being a real pain today. You know, what do I do about him? It's about what do you do about your instruction? What do you do with your learning environment? Um, we also repurposed um, some Title I coaches. We used to have Title I literacy coaches, Title I math coaches. Now we have UDL coaches that focus on literacy, UDL coaches that focus on math. And that might sound like a semantic change, and on one level it is, but the reason we changed those titles was because we wanted all that support and coaching work that those folks were doing to be grounded in UDL, not just come in with, well, this is the latest, greatest literacy piece or reading piece or this piece. What is it support? What are the guidelines it's connected to? Um, and then most recently, we've um, added three other folks, um, uh, Katie Delaney and, well, Katie and Delaney are, are more like UDL um, coaches as well. They work out of the central office and kind of handle some bigger picture kinds of pieces. And then Nick Williams is our um, latest and greatest uh, addition in, in around instructional technology. And he kind of drives a lot of the work with our learning management system. Um, and they are fabulous and um, I would encourage you and I wish I could remember the exact name but every Friday Nick and Delaney do this thing called like fun technology something or other it's basically a four minute YouTube video on a tool and they, it's they make it so easy and so connected to what we're doing so pretty much what we do now is everything we talk about do and breathe the first question is, how does it support the implementation of UDL and then facilitate those teacher conversations? And we like to try and show off our teachers as much as possible because they're fabulous. What I, what I love about what both, uh, both, both of you said is that it wasn't a matter of finding more resources. It was a matter of, of really re, reallocating those resources, restructuring them, redesigning them, but not necessarily retrofitting them. And I think that that in and of itself speaks to this larger idea of, of UDL. So it's nice to see that embodiment. I have a ton of questions that I can keep. Sue, can I keep going? I think she's giving me the thumbs up. Keep if going. She, I'm, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna keep going anyway. Uh, Let's so do I have one another more, question. I'm sorry. Let's do one more and then we'll we'll move on to the next section. How's that? All right, okay, because I've got them all queued up. Uh, here's right. an important one, and this one comes from Sue herself. She asked it through Twitter. Uh, if you want to follow Sue, that's at sharden22, um, and uh, this one gets a little personal. So um, what part of your leadership style, your own leadership style, Carrie and, and George, um, proved most beneficial when implementing the UDL framework district-wide? What helped push it in your own personal style? I can say... Um... I, I thought a lot about that. It's a great question, Sue. Um, I, I think I, I go to a loose, tight management style. You know, there are certain things you're going to be loose on because you want the creativity. You want to give people um, a chance to, you know, explore a problem deeply and come back with us making this kind of change. It's important they understand the vision, but you've got to let people go and you got to be, you know, um, you've got to be okay with that as a leader and be willing to learn from a lot of other people. And then there are some things you just, you got to be tight on, you know, we, for example, an example of being tight on something was we had to pick a learning management system. You know, we couldn't have the days of this potpourri of different ways of uh, having kids, you know, get the, you know, getting the content, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, um, having some protocols in place, of uh, not just using Weebly Haiku, 25 other different things, because that's hard for like, a, for, you know, kids just with their executive functioning skills. So, you know, you've got to make some decisions and be tight on some things, but. Okay, my turn. Your turn. <laughs> okay. Um, probably the most important leadership quality that I think um, worked for me is my OCD, um, which caused me to be relentless and persistent and focused and driven and torture everybody into trying them, get them to be focused and relentless and persistent. Um, and, and I think that, that, that helped. Um, I think the second um, thing was um, my desire to make sure that everybody was involved. So um, before we even really moved forward with UDL, it was really key 
um, for the conversation to be all of the district administrators. So our, you know, our, our current like director of elementary ed, Laura Hack, and, and our secondary ed, Bill Jensen and I do lots of conversations together. Um, our superintendent um, at the time, Dr. Quick was involved. We have a new superintendent, Dr. Roberts, who's been right in there with us having those conversations. So knowing that it's a team and it has to be everybody, not just one person. Um, and probably the most important thing for me was making sure that you had lots of smart people around you and you let them do what they do. That's Thank excellent. You. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Sue. Great. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Carrie and George. That was excellent. Um, appreciate you indulging me and in answering that question about leadership. I think that's such an important uh, thing for, for le future leaders out there to be thinking about, you know, what are the strategies or the personality parts of my personality that I really need to make sure I focus on and shine so that um, I can support my students as, and teachers as well as you both have. So thank you for sharing that. So we're going to move on now to part two of our um, conversation this evening, and I've asked both Carrie and George to share a few pitfalls that that um, their wisdom will help the rest of us avoid, and then um, some successes, so some overall successes that they really want to celebrate, both from the perspective of their staff and from the perspective of their students. And um, Carrie, if you don't mind, we'll go ahead and start us off on that conversation. Sure. Um, I, I think a couple of uh, pitfalls I'd want to share are it's it's the importance of um, you know planning and making sure you have repurposed your staff to make sure that this is going to be a successful implementation. Just buying devices or just um, going out and you know purchasing um, you know the furniture for the classroom it's it's not going to to be effective unless you're really thoughtful about the way you're gonna be um, leveraging your staff. And then I, I think the other um, important piece, and I think we've gotten much better at this, is having a professional development plan laid out at the start of the year. So our staff really knows what the focus is gonna be for um, the entire school year. They want to know what your, your focus is for that year. So if it's gonna be on assessment and looking at you know multiple means of how you're gonna assess kids on um, the, the competencies, they really want to know that at the start of the school year. And um, I don't think I did as good of a job at the beginning of this process as I um, as we're getting at right now. We're really clear about laying out that vision at the start of the year. And, and I think that's that's really important. So it was, a I think, a pitfall at the beginning but of the journey, but I think we've gotten a lot better at that as um, we've continued with this work. And then, like I said, the staff piece is so important. You've got to make sure you have people um, in the right places at the right time. And I think we kind of started this work very, we're, we're kind of, we always say the early adopters or sometimes on the bleeding edge. And when you're, you know, at that early stage of things, you've got to make decisions um, that, you know, if, if I had waited five years, you you would have had more, you know, choice to, to have made that decision on. So I, I think the other piece is you want to be confident in the decisions you make and stick with them. You know, you don't want to, uh, you know, necessarily second guess, you know, the decision you made about the whatever the device, the PD, whatever it might have been. You know, I think you want to be reflective on it, but I think trying not to second guess every decision you make uh, doesn't help the situation. So again, I think professional development and being really purposeful about that plan has been crucial to the work. And then also the way in which um, we made some staffing decisions and that repurposing of staff is super important. And I'm gonna leave with, then I'll give it to George. I think the other really big piece is managing the transitions, you know, honoring the loss that people experience when you're moving to this type of model of learning and of teaching is really important to be aware of. So we've talked a lot about, you know, how as building leaders, do you help people manage that tradition? Because you really are rocking the world, moving their cheese, whatever you want to call it. And I, I think you have to, you know, be mindful of that human factor. So when you're making this type of change to the learning environment, I, that that's probably another, um, I, I think, pitfall you might not think of. 
and that's managing that transition because not we're usually the most enthusiastic people we're the leaders we want this change not everybody has that kind of excitement so there's a really good book called managing transitions we we've, we've really looked to and, and use some of that work um, as we've gone through this process Okay, um, I think a couple things that early on that we discovered and we would probably do different, uh, probably the biggest one initially was uh, after uh, doing some book studies and conversations, um, it became really clear that our staff felt UDL was about technology. And so those who were not excited um, said, well, we can't do this. We don't have all the technology. And we, almost, and we had literally had to take about five steps back to start again um, and help people understand that this was about um, instruction and curriculum and learning environments and not technology that that you really don't need any tech well you need I mean the, depends on how you define technology if you define technology as something with a plug coming out of it you don't need that is that a good tool that'll enhance learning for kids absolutely but you can do it without and uh, we kind of demonstrated that in our first UDL forum um, our secondary teachers who were presenting and sharing their ideas on their classrooms were given the, the uh, directive um, not to use any technology in their, in their presentation during the day. And as you can imagine, some of the most creative kinds of things um, were shared and it really drove home the point that this was really more about creating options. Um, and again, using technology as additional options is helpful, um, but it was not all about technology. So we sort of had to step back from where we started because um, we, we took a left and we should have taken a right unintentionally. Um, the other big, big, big thing that we should have done early on, and it was several years into it, was to help people understand that UDL is not an initiative. It's not a program, it's not a strategy. Because what we had folks thinking was, here's another initiative. Let's put this one next to all the others. And then other people were saying, you know, if I keep my head down, this too shall pass. So we had to sort of then spend some time backing up and really kind of going through some several trainings about identifying what our current initiatives were, what people thought um, current requirements around things were, and how those supported the three principles of UDL. And those that we couldn't figure out how they supported, we put her over, over on, and I don't even call it a parking lot, it may have been more of a demolition derby lot. Um, and put them up there and then looked at which of those could we just go let go away because they didn't support our, our framework and there were a couple of things what we found was there are a lot of stuff over on that other demolition lot that were um, state mandates uh, and we had to do you know keep them around and had to do them but we, we were able to blend some things so I think helping people understand it's a framework not an initiative and giving them time to really work through, well, I have to do this and this and this and this and this, and helping them understand how the, many of those things, almost all those things, support what you're doing. Because our view was that we had a lot of random acts of improvement going on, and we had to help people align their hard work so that we moved forward. It wasn't like people weren't trying and, and didn't want to be successful and didn't want students to learn. But we've, in, over the years in education, we always sort of just throw one more thing in there. If we were a boat, we would have sank years ago from all the extra weight being thrown in and nothing being drained out. So we really kind of took that approach. The other biggie, um, the other big conversation we had to have, um, and people always cringe when I say this, is that um, we'll, we'll say out loud that UDL is not about the students. Um, UDL is about the learning environment, and it's about the instruction, and it's about what we create. And then based on that, the students learn and we have learner outcomes. Um, Teresa Heines, who is our current assistant superintendent for human resources, was the director of elementary at the time, and we were trying to come up with these really cool diagrams. And she walked in our, our room and said, what are you doing? We said, well, we're looking at this learning environment, just a circle on a whiteboard. We had another circle that said student outcomes and said, we're trying to figure out how to, how to really kind of visually display this. And she said, well, here it's simple. We have 100% control over the learning environment. If the student outcomes aren't what we wanted, then our learning environment stinks. Let's go back and fix it. And walked out of the room. And we were like, wow, that's pretty simple and to the point. But it really drives a lot of what our thinking is. You know, we can complain about poverty and drugs and all that other stuff that goes on in kids' lives. But when they come through the door, we have control over the learning environment. So by building good, accessible, creative, 
um, environments with lots of options will lead to better student learning. And so that was a, the big shift for us going from it's a student's problem to and it's not that it's our problem, it's that it's our um, job to try and resolve that and create those options. So those are, those are probably the, um, I'm looking at, I, I took some notes as, as I was thinking. Um, those were probably the, the real biggies, really people confusing UDL to be technology needed, um, looking at it as an initiative and still looking at the student as needing to be fixed, if you will, as opposed to the learning environment need to be attended to. Wow. Okay. I'm impressed, overwhelmed. <laughs> that was some wonderful uh, points to share with everybody. I, I think I, when I think about both of uh, Bartholomew and Fraser and being on the bleeding edge, as Carrie put it, it really does put you out there, you know, it makes you vulnerable to, to bad things happening and, and uh, failure. But, you know, having the courage to try it, pick up the pieces and move on is absolutely um, critical in education and, and so thank you from from our UDL community for for being out there and putting yourself out and, and really taking the leadership and in, in this implementation um, dilemma or ch challenge at least uh, so Brian I'm going to turn it back to you and find out if we've got some additional comments questions out there that we need to be addressing I got, I got to tell you this great uh, comment that uh, Leanne Woodley uh, shared just a moment ago in our chat. Uh, she said, uh, for me, UDL is not another thing to, teach you, to add to a teacher's plate, but rather it's about showing teachers that UDL is the plate. Um, that's another one of those, boom, right? That's another knowledge bomb that, that was just dropped. And so um, I really, I, I had to share that because I think it goes I also uh, tweeted you out, George, with the, uh, if, if education was a boat, we would have sunk by the weight of the, all the initiatives we adopt, I think, oh, right? Um, so um, I'm, I'm still reeling a little bit too from, from like Sue was. Um, but to questions, um, from uh, uh, Angelina Krieger, uh, who's at Mrs. Krieger, uh, part of our Novi uh, UDL SWAT team, um, her big question, she asked this in the beginning, but um, I want to come back to it. So uh, her question, uh, let me see if I can find it. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going as quickly as I can. So um, how do you provide the PL that, or the professional learning or the professional development for teachers so they can truly implement UDL? What does that look like? Is there, are there phases to it? Is it exploration? How is it based? Yeah, I can start that conversation. I can tell you that, um, it's a journey and we started off um, very purposeful with giving people um, some very specific uh, common language around universal design for learning. And this was year, five years ago using, you know, the, the work of the Macomb ISD and being very um, systematic. What we're now finding is that just like UDL, our teachers need a UDL professional learning experience. So, we can't do one size professional learning anymore. That's why I think the coaching is so important and it's gotta be, um, I think, flexible. So there's gonna be times where you, just like with teaching, you need some whole group instruction to bring people together. And then there's other times where grade level teams need to get together to work on something. And then there's another opportunity for that teacher to get that, uh, personalize something that they really need at that moment in time. So what we're finding is it's very much scaffolded to the teacher. Um, and there's got to be some things, like I said, that that's where I think that loose, tight leadership comes into play that we've got to be tight on because we want to have, like George said, a curriculum framework. You know, we try really hard to have a, a consistent model there. But again, it's kind of like a rubber band. I think it goes in and out. And um, for us, the professional development has been personalized some of the time and then other times it's got to be really um strategic my dog just woke up <laughs> she must have liked that question <laughs> i i think i need a puppy I, right <laughs> good little friend. um you know i guess what i would say is i'm i'm, I'm doing this this presentation about our, our sort of our district journey tomorrow um and i happen to be a grateful dead fan and the title of the journey is what a long strange trip it's been all right on, brother. And it has been a long, strange trip, and it's going to be longer and stranger as we go forward. Um, 
you know, I, th I think probably the most important thing we've learned about UDL and about professional development um, is that we don't know <clears throat> and we're still learning and figuring it out. Um, so when we started professional development, it was probably actually <laughs> the feedback we were provided from the teachers was, well, it would be nice if the administrators modeled this when they're trying to teach us about it. And we were like, yeah, well, you know, we don't know how to use a whiteboard and we don't know how to do this and we don't know how to do that. Um, and maybe that's when we realized it's better for teachers to provide the training. I don't know. But um, so the feedback of modeling UDL in your professional development, I think, is important. Um, for us, grounding everything, all the trainings in UDL, um, we're finding to be very effective. That creates a common language. It creates a, a culture. Um, and, and it creates a willingness of folks to, to, take, to take risks. Um, and again, I think for us, the teacher to teacher, because all our UDL facilitators, our UDL coordinators were, um, were regular ed teachers or were teachers of some kind. I think we have one or two that may have been special ed teachers, but the majority of our folks were regular ed teachers. So if you will, when a regular ed teacher is looking for some supports or training and it's coming from another regular ed teacher, they really, they really see that person as credible and understanding the shoes that they're walking in. Um, so I think that was key. Um, I think a big professional development piece for us is the, the network of people that we've developed um, in, in terms of UDL. I mean, I'd, um, I, I have the sort of the, the pleasure, I guess, of sort of being the face on the webinar, but quite frankly, there's hundreds of people in, in BCSE who, could, who should be sitting here talking about what's going on. Um, and, and just the internal network has been, has been great in teachers supporting teachers. The external piece where we bring folks from all over the country in, in the summertime and we do a week-long UDL Institute um, has been amazing. Uh, we, we do our, now we're in Indiana, we start school very early, like August 1st is typically when the kids start. I know everybody on the East Coast is going, you've lost your mind and you'd be correct. Um, so we have an, a UDL Institute actually about the second week of July, which is still summertime even in Indiana, and teachers are not paid to attend the Institute. It's a totally voluntary piece. And we, every year for the last four years, we've had 150, 135 to 150 teachers just come and literally spend a full day, Monday through Thursday, half day on Friday for the whole week learning about UDL and interacting. Part of the reason is we bring in, you know, Katie Novak and John Mundorf and Louie and, you know, you know, Liz Berkowitz and Lisa Carey and Nikki and all kinds of folks. So they get to, they get to, to sort of talk to the experts, but they also get to talk to each other because they're those, those folks along with, you know, people like Stephanie Craig and who I saw her name on here, who was a UDL facilitator and now she's at Kansas um, working on her doctorate, which is good for her, bad for us. Um, and, and Kate Agrin and some other folks, Joni um, Degner, they all facilitate. So we have outsiders, insiders mingling, and, and our week is really, um, I think it's really cool because we sort of set out a structure to the week and a schedule. You know, last week, our, last year, our theme, we really targeted characteristics of an expert learner, and we lay some things out. But at lunchtime on the first day, we all meet and talk about well, what are you hearing? What are the participants saying? What are the teachers saying they want to hear? And because those people are so on it, we could say to the afternoon, I could turn around and look at John Mundorf and go, John, can you do, do maybe an hour on blah, blah, blah? And he's like, oh yeah, sure, no problem. And we become really responsive to the, to the teachers that are there and it becomes really flowing and flexible. And I think it's a perfect modeling of UDL and looking at options and looking at student choice. Um, and looking at different ways of people interacting and engaging and, and expressing their knowledge. So I think for us, our biggie is that, that week-long UDL Institute um, in the summer. Very nice, very nice. So I have uh, one more, uh, it comes from uh, Leanne Woodley. Oh, and by the way, George, I'm still, I'm, I'm still craving an invite out to, the, out to the Summer Institute, man. I've been passing it around, hoping that maybe you'll hear it in the back alley and be like, oh, yeah, we'll invite Brian Dean. So, you know, I'm just saying, I'm just throwing it out there. Let me know. You're um, always welcome. Oh, You're always welcome. You so, heard it here, folks. You heard it here. We're open. We'll put anybody to work. All right. I, hey, I got, I'm a big man. I'll, I'll carry lots of stuff for you. Let me ask this other question. Uh, this one comes from Leanne Woodley uh, out there in Australia. Um, how did you keep UDL visible uh, on the agenda in large schools? 
Um, and I think that's uh, I think that's a pretty important question. So how did you keep it in the forefront of everybody's mind with all the other initiatives? Well, I'll go first on this one, I guess. Uh, for us, um, again, it our school board, our superintendent, all said UDL is the curriculum or is the framework that drives all our curriculum and instruction for all students. Boom, that was it. So anything we do and talk about comes back to UDL. Um, you know, I had a uh, was at a school board meeting last night, um, and our school board uh, holds their meetings in each of the different um, schools throughout the district throughout the year. And typically, the schools do a a presentation um, about you know a best practice or something they're doing, and all the presentations to the board are grounded in UDL. Um, so it, it's now become part of just our our culture and our core. You know, even when our when Dr. Roberts came in as our new superintendent, he came in knowing that our core was UDL. And what was really cool is he came to the UDL Institute, not just to say hi, I'm the superintendent. He came and sat in sessions and took notes and learned and talked to teachers, talked to facilitators, talk about great modeling. Um, you know, he's learning along with everyone else. Um, so it's really about. It, 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 for us, it's really who we are. And th how we got there, we just kept using the same language and common language and connecting everything as best we can. Um, Relentless and persistent, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I think our, our vision and our strategic plan and that graphic I showed you, um, really focuses our work. And we've been really intentional. Our superintendent is extremely intentional about our vision, which is innovate, learn, lead. Everybody in the district knows that everybody in the district um, really looks to those, I think, very simple three words to, to, to keep our, our focus and in our conversations. And um, I, I don't think it's about uh, it's something that you've adopted and in Frazier it really is about the student and putting students first and everything we look at is about what's best for kids and what is best for kids is personalized learning good instruction and being in a I think in a community where um, we really still care about kids and there's still a lot of great trust in the teacher has been very important in Frazier and I, I think that's why um, we've been able to move as fast as we've had with this work but again, I think it comes down to having a really strong um, vision. And it, those words are very simple, you know, innovate, learn, lead. Those are the things that we want our teachers to do. We want our kids to do that. And um, we, we go back to that every time we, we make a decision about the work that we're trying to do. You know, it's interesting as I listen to you both talk, I, I um, connect it back to uh, yoga practice. So that's something in that I have a lot of, uh, passion for, but it's that kind of Zen, that yin and yang, and Carrie, I think you called it loose tight, and George was talking about in systematic implementation, but yet flowing and flexible. And I think that's a really interesting sort of tension that um, is part of working with people, right? There's always that give and take, and there has to be some part that's really systematic and strong, and then this part that's flexible and giving. And I think that maybe encapsulates what's necessary to really get this implementation done, a really strong, firm foundation, but yet this flexible uh, uh, modeling that we can, we can customize it to the needs of teachers and the needs of kids, really is kind of the backbone of UDL. So that's my observation listening to both of you. All right, well, we have a few minutes to give um, some final comments. So um, uh, Carrie, if you wanna go ahead and start and we'll let George have the final word tonight then. Sure, thank you. Well, I first want to just thank you for the opportunity to obviously uh, share our story in Frazier and obviously to, to hear about Bartholomew. That's a district that we've watched and looked at their work very closely. So that's exciting for me. I, you know, I think um, the whole conversation tonight was focused in around UDL and leadership. And um, probably one of the most important things I've learned is that teacher leadership makes this type of work happen. So the more you can build capacity with your teachers, the more successful you're gonna be. You know, you have to have, um, a, Dr. Richards always calls it a sticky vision. And when you know the vision can stick, 
um, and your teacher leaders can tell that story, you know you're moving in the right direction. So for me, um, it's been that teacher leadership piece that's the most exciting and really the most rewarding part of the work because you know you're going to then directly impact kids because it's the teachers who are in front of the classroom each and every day. And it's my job to provide those opportunities so the teachers can be successful and can meet the needs of all of their children. Okay, final word. Uh, ditto. Um, I agree. Um, I, I, a couple of things I think that are most exciting for us, obviously, are the student outcomes um, and seeing positives and, and improvement in student learning. I think seeing our teachers really excited and engaged um, uh, about the work they're doing. And, see, and again, they get excited when they see the kids are excited and the kids are learning. So I think there's a direct, obviously a direct connection there. We're all educators and what gets us going is when the kids are learning. So I think that's a real positive. Um, the one thing I, I guess I, I need to um, to mention that I failed to mention before because it didn't fit in a category, so I'm making it up. Um, probably the most one of the most significant things we did was ground, uh, and Louie was a big part of, of uh, developing this, was ground our teacher evaluation rubric and process in UDL. Um, in our district, 50% of a teacher's evaluation is based on the implementation of UDL and then another 15% on PBIS. So 65% of a teacher's evaluation really targets around UDL. And it's not a gotcha system, it's a, it's a growth system. Um, you know, when, when our teachers union does a, does a survey at the end of the year, one of the key questions is, do you feel that this is, you know, that you're being treated honestly and respectfully? And the answer is like 95% of the teachers say yes. Because the conversation is about how do we get better, not gotcha. And I think by, by taking a process that way, that's really helped knowing that we all grow and we all use the same um, basic um, teach or our success rubric from you know, myself to our directors of elementary and secondary ed and assistants and superintendents all the way down to our, our lay baseball coach who might not be a teacher. Um, our expectation is that those folks learn about UDL as well. So um, it's, you know, what I can say is BCSC is a, a, an exciting place to work because we're never done and we're always pushing forward. Um, I see all these people want to come to our institute. We do, we do on occasion allow some external people to come. So um, <clears throat> just, just let me know. And thanks for hosting this. This was fabulous and a lot of fun. Well, thanks to both of you. Um, it's been wonderful to hear, hear your story. And um, um, I imagine that both of you will be getting lots of teacher applications in the next few months. So be looking for those pouring in. Who doesn't want to work in a district where learning is valued and teachers are respected? That's really what we're all in this for. So kudos to both of you. And thank you for joining us tonight and sharing all your um, loose tight wisdom. We really do appreciate it. Uh, so before you leave, I just wanted to share um, a little bit more about what's coming next for the UDL IRN. So don't go away. For those of you who um, do not know, we do have a conference coming up and that is coming um, in March. This year we're excited that will be in Orlando, Florida. Our pre-conference is March 29th and then the summit, the re regular summit is the 30th and 31st of March. Um, we will be um, taking registration. So registrations is up and running, proposals are closed. Actually that deadline um, has passed, but the registration is up and we're looking forward to having you join us. We also have new this year, several pre-conference uh, sessions for you to select from, as well as wonderful concurrent sessions, design lab, um, all kinds of great UDL networking. That's probably my favorite part of the summit is I get to talk to all the wonderful people who joined us tonight and the presenters you heard from, um, Brian Dean and the rest of our UDL uh, IRN leadership group. So um, if you've never experienced it, come on out and join us. It's, it's really a don't miss three days. I can't tell you how much, how excited I am to go to Orlando and um, connect with everybody once again. And then Brian, if you want to talk a little bit about UDL chat. 
Yeah, so you want to keep it going. Uh, UDL chat happens every first and third Wednesday of the month. Uh, we are growing bigger and bigger all the time. Pretty soon we're going to outgrow Twitter and have to move to other places. Um, this UDL movement is massive. So every first and third Wednesday of the month, we have people like Katie drop in, uh, Louie drops in, uh, John Mundorf drops in, you know, all the rock stars. George is there. Um, uh, and this week, uh, Ron Rogers uh, from, from another brilliant UDL rock star from uh, Okali will be hosting and uh, we're talking about hidden curriculum. So you want to check it out tomorrow. We start at nine and go till 930. Prepare to have your face melted off with UDL greatness. There you go. How's that for a plug? That is a plug. All right. So thank, thank you once again. Thanks to uh, Carrie and to George and Brian for uh, moderating tonight. And thank you for joining us. We really do appreciate your support. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at our ne next Network and Learn. And don't forget the summit in March. Thank you all. And we'll say good night and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>